Hi all, uh, welcome back to my channel. It's been a little while, but uh, I've got a great interview this week. It's with Mr. Loz Garrett. Um, myself and Loz met up a couple of weeks ago, just before he started uh, his rehearsals with Mr. Jamie Cullum. It was so nice to sit down and chat to Loz. We'd actually talked about doing this for a while, so this is great that this is the first one back, as it were. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy it. It'd be really great if you could subscribe to my channel on YouTube, and also give me a follow over on Instagram as well. And if you like these videos, like them, and also click on the notification bell below. Um, and it will keep you updated um, as to when I put out new content. Um, anyway, uh, enjoy the interview and thanks Laws again for doing it. So my name is Laws Garrett. I am a, uh, I'm a bass player, play bass guitar and double bass. Uh, mostly spend my time playing with Jamie Cullum. And I do quite a lot of West End work as well on shows like Hamilton, Wicked, Book of Mormon, and Waitress. Nice. And a bit of teaching and other bits and bobs as well. And how did you get into bass guitar or double bass? Was it? Yeah, well, so I actually started on violin um, when I was about six. I started on violin. I played violin for kind of 12 years or so, something like that. And then when I was about 14, 13, 14, my school big band needed a bass player. And my mate was like, oh, my mate plays violin, it's basically the same. Uh, so they gave me a bass guitar and I just, you know, and I think, I think the first thing I ever played was either like, I think it was Love Shack or the Peter Gunn theme. It's one of the two, but they were the two first songs that I ever played on, on bass guitar. And so I started just playing in this school big band. Yeah, and then just got like much better at bass than I was at the violin very quickly. So it became clear that that was the, that was the path. So what was your progression after that then? Into? So I just did like, uh, I just did kind of, uh, big, I did like county big bands and school big bands. I did a lot of big band stuff and then played a little bit of like uh, small band jazz stuff. And then played lots of guitar, was really into like indie and rock music and all that stuff. And then went to music college when I was 18. I went to Trinity College of Music, which is in Greenwich, to do a jazz course. Did that for four years. Um, Played lots of double bass, played lots of bass guitar. Um, and then from there, kind of had two years of just freelancing and doing bits and pops. And then I got the audition for Jamie's band. And then that was very much a sort of career, life-changing, directional moment, really. Like, yeah, that was a big, that was a big change. So do you, had you been kind of driven towards the kind of the jazz world? Was that your, your main I guess thing, your main so. Well, no, kind of, I mean, I started, yeah, I started playing jazz I guess on, on, on bass guitar. But like I said, I was really into indie and rock and on violin I was played folk music and classical music. I've always been kind of into everything really. Yeah, so it's always been very eclectic for me. And actually one of the, th I kind of struggled at music college a little bit because it was so polarized and, and like very jazz specific and jazz heavy that I kind of, I think I ended up getting a bit restless. I get a bit restless if I'm doing too much of one thing. Um, I quite like the variety. And so, yeah, I think I, like, I really enjoyed learning about jazz and I think it gave me loads of skills. But then one of the great things about doing Jamie's band has been that everyone's into loads of different types of music. And um, so suddenly I felt like I had this sort of like permission to be really into the music that I wanted. Like I remember in our first tour, we were, we were somewhere in Europe and they knew the people that were like crewing for a band called Everything Everything. So we went to watch but they got us on the guest list and we went to watch Everything, Everything. And I was like, oh my God, am I allowed to? I was like, oh, I can like indie music again. I was like, everyone likes indie music in this band. I was like, this is incredible. You know, it's like suddenly it was really legitimate that I could like all this other music again, which was great. I kind of got really in touch with my teenage thing and then kind of, and, I, and the West End thing I find really fun for that because there's so much, like even in any of the shows, there's so many different types of music that it kind of feels like I'm doing like all my favorite gigs in one, in one gig which is really nice. So yeah, like I'm really into jazz and I love improvising. I think that's given me some skills that are really applicable to everything, but definitely all my favorite work is like a bit of a melting pot of everything, mm. really. So I guess, would you describe Jamie as kind of like a crossover? Because obviously, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, his gig is pretty, um, his gig's pretty wild in terms of genre and whatever. It's like, it can kind of be anything. You know, we'll be playing a standard one minute and then it'll head into like a sort of, groove thing or a uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, it's huge, hugely crossover. And he's really into uh, like everything. And his kind of knowledge of recorded music is insane. Like, I, like, he never, he didn't study, he can't really read music. But his, yeah, his kind of like mental Rolodex of like recorded music is just insane. Like, he's listened to like everything and has assimilated loads of it. And he's really passionate about loads of stuff. And so, yeah, his gig would be great. It's like, yeah, it's like, going from a standard to playing like a funk thing to playing like a sort of singer-songwriter James Taylor-esque thing to you know anything in between and yeah so if that was your kind of like first kind of quote unquote like big gig mm. what, what do you think you uh, really learned uh, by taking that gig uh, that you had previously didn't get from your musical training before that? yeah so what did I get uh, I think I, I think when I was younger, I was I was quite anal about music and preparation and wanting to know what was going on and what was coming up. And whereas like Jamie's gig is really chaotic, <laughs> especially at that point, there was no set list, there was no anything. <laughs> you know, it's like we had to kind of start with the same tune. We knew what tune we were starting with, and I kind of knew what the end tune was going to be, but anything in between could happen you know and he doesn't it's not like he even just says what he's going to play he just starts playing the intro to something and you'd be like is that that sounds a bit like it's I'm going to get my double but no no it's not actually it's this one I'm going to get the bass guitar um so you just like you never really knew what was coming and so I had to get quite uh I had to get quite at peace with like chaos which has been really good for me and now I'm like I've kind of gone the other way where people are like if people if I kind of if people around me are being quite like anal about it and they're like so we need to do this and it starts here and I'm just like oh we'll just you know let's just see what happens it'll be cool you know it's kind of I've gone like completely the other side and um so that was that was like really good the big thing yeah I think kind of I'd never really played in front of audiences that were that big so kind of getting to grips with that, although it doesn't really phase me too much. I find playing to smaller audiences much more intimidating than, you know, I find playing to 50 people way more scary than playing to 20,000. Not that I do that very often. <laughs> Most of the time it's like 2,000. But um, yeah, but I find, you know, I guess you feel the same. It's like playing to like 20 people is terrifying because you can see everyone's face and you can see whether they're enjoying it and what their reaction is, whereas like, you know, two thousand people is like well, whatever. It's just like a sea of faces. So there was that. I think also I had to get um, also I had to get like way less picky about sound and like ease of playing. You know, because quite often it would be rental because Jamie's gig is both, and so there'd be like a rental double bass that was not very good, and it's like well, that's what I've got. So I've just got to get used to, you know, so one of the skills that I learned was kind of learning how to get the best out of a bass quite quickly, which has been a really valuable skill. You know, if you're doing like 20 festivals and 18 of those, you're on rental bases that you're going to get your hands on five minutes before the gig. You really learn quickly how to, you kind of, you know, you try something, you go, I'm not going up there. It's like, that sounds dreadful. Or you're like, okay, so I can hit it this hard or I can, it's like, oh, I need to play like, here on the you know over the pickups or I need to play like here on the double bass or that kind of thing so I got pretty good at that and then yeah just you know like uh, festivals and stuff like the sound not being good and having to learn to I think the biggest skill that taught me was like a learning to have faith in myself on that front and like trust that trust that even if it didn't necessarily sound good where I was being like I do know the notes that I'm playing and I do know what I'm doing so I've just got to be really confident with that and trust that it's going to sound okay out front, which was quite a it's quite a good skill to learn, I guess. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's really important. So many people can, can uh, find not having their own equipment on a gig a deal breaker. Yeah. Did you, I mean... It's, uh, there've been a couple of there've been a couple of horror shows. There's one, there's one festival in particular that's like I really had. A, I mean, you know, I'm saying this like I kind of I'm really of, like at peace with the whole thing. Like I definitely have meltdowns when like the gear's bad. There was while well, we were doing Newport Jazz Festival. So like, this amazing jazz festival on the east coast of like sort of Rhode Island vibe. Amazing view out on the stage, and the festival had two double bases. And the first one was just sort of going like. When I played, it was like, well, that's unusable. So we ditched that. They got the second bass. And this is like in the gig, you know, it's like, this isn't the sound check. It's like, we've started. It's just like, that's just going, 
like, okay, get the other one. So the other one comes on and it's just feeding back. Like any note that I play is feeding back. So it's like, okay, kill it, kill it in the wet, in the amp. And I'll put something in the monitor and the monitor's feeding back. So it's like, okay, kill it in the monitor. So I'm just doing the gig blind basically like, or deaf, I guess would be a better way to describe it. Where I'm just, you know, I mean, it's like we're playing with a big band. So it's really loud on stage and I'm like, because I haven't got it in the wedge and I haven't got it in the amp. So I'm just like, I can't hear a note I'm playing. And I'm just like trusting that it's okay. But I'm getting really stressed. because I'm like, this is, this is a horrible experience. <laughs> and then something happened. And then basically the, I was having, and then I started having problems with the electric bass. And I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> like, give me a break somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and the tech came on and did something. And you know those boss tuners? the ones there's like they've got a funny setting where you can click it and it turns it into like a flat tuning so it's as if you want to tune like a half step down so you you want to tune like e flat a flat d flat g flat but it comes up on the pedal as eadg i've no idea why you need that setting because i mean you're just asking for what then happened which was that he was doing something on the pedal board he accidentally pre- like engage that setting that I didn't even know existed so then I went to tune, like the next tune I went to tune, tune my electric and um and I was like I was like god that's weird I'm just really sharp it's like but it was in tune it was in tune like five minutes ago because obviously it's showing up as like f because this pedal this tune has gone into like flat setting so it's showing as f even though I'm playing an e and so I'm like I like detune so that it's saying e whatever and then we start this tune and I'm playing and Brad on drums is like shouting something at me and I'm like, what, what? And I'm like so flustered and stressed. I'm like, what, what, what? And then the tech runs on and he's like, you, you, it sounds mental, you're playing, you're really flat. I'm like, no, but I'm in... Ch- ch-. And then I finally clocked what had happened. I basically was like playing the intro of this song like a semitone out. It's like a semitone sharp. <laughs> or flat, no, it was a semitone flat. And, um, and I just had, and I couldn't really hear it. And I was so stressed because of all the double bass stuff that I, I just had a complete meltdown. I was like, I can't, how did I did not hear that? I was a semitone out and like, yeah, just mental. Yeah, so it's not like I take it all in my stride either. <laughs> but, you know, certainly, certainly like even now, like now if the sound's bad, I'm like, is it as bad as that gig? It's like, no, it's fine then. <laughs> so I can, I can get through this. So I got through that one. So this is all right. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a particularly horrific one. It's amazing. <laughs> So does it, with, with a gig like Jamie's, does that inform, how does that inform your kind of like practice regime? Because obviously you're doing groove stuff as well as, I guess, soloing and playing for Jamie's. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I guess, like, I'm not, I mean, I probably shouldn't say, but I'm not, I'm not a great practicer, actually. I don't spend a lot of time doing it. But what, I guess what I do is, like, if I'm, if I'm listening, I try and listen really hard. I try and let, like, the listening that I'm doing inform my playing, if that makes sense, mm. a bit more like I kind of listen to something and, and it's kind of more like a general aesthetic rather than like really going in deep. I guess for, I guess just, I just, it feels like I need to be, it just always feels like I need to be listening to and playing a lot of different music. That actually is the thing that keeps me most in shape for Jamie's gig. It's like doing some jazz gigs, doing some pop functions, doing some singer songwriter things with my friends that write songs. All that stuff makes me feel like I'm kind of ready for Jamie's thing rather than like if I was just playing standards all the time, then suddenly all the other stuff would be really, would be quite hard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think just, I think the biggest thing about being, is just being really curious for Jamie's gigs, like being curious about checking loads of stuff out and just a variety of things really. Um, yeah, I don't know whether his gig is kind of necessarily really impacted on my practice necessarily but maybe i mean i don't know <laughs> so who are your kind of bass influences and who are your bass influences yeah so on double bass uh it's like um it's like ray brown ron carter charlie hayden you know i feel like i guess ray brown really it's like that to me is like the sound if i could get anywhere close to that sound i'd be really happy um, and I love all, I love that way that like Ron Carter plays and all the kind of the second Miles Quintet thing, like all the stuff on like the 64 concert and that vibe. I really love that, that kind of really 
kind of creative and interactive, but also like really holding it down and having a strong, having a strong crotch hit. It's people that make nice sounds. It's like for double bass for me is really heavily about the sound of it. Um, so kind of that that period of like. 70s to mid 80s of Ron is like out the out the out the game for me. That sort of horrible period of jazz where they like di'd it all the time. It's just I saw a, I saw a great video the other day of um, who's that guy? Uh, he plays drums for like John Mayer and a load of other people. Something Sterloid is it? Oh, I don't know his name. I can't remember his name. But he did this. He did this. He did this really funny video about the like that di'd bass sound from like the seventies and the eighties, and about how it's like, how did that happen for like fifteen years? It's like the worst sound of any music ever. And he was like, about how like people were in, like, well, surely people were just in the sessions and then just realized that their ears were bleeding and didn't. And it's like, how did they not know why? You know, it's like everyone's just going to A and E after these sessions because the sound is so unbelievably like offensive. <laughs> And it is just a horrible, yeah. So for me, double bass is really all about the sound. So like Ray Brown is, is, is amazing for that and Charlie Hayden. And like Dave Holland, I really like. I've gotten really into, oh, what's his name? Paul, Paul Cowell or something like that. The guy that plays in the Punch Brothers. If you don't know if you know that band. Um, he's an amazing, amazing double bass player. A kind of bluegrass and can do all the classical stuff and great pit sound. Really interesting, great, great bass playing. I really like him. And then electric bass wise, it's a lot of like the Motown guys, you know, it's the same as everyone. It's like Willie Weeks, James Jameson, Bob Babbitt, it's like all those guys. Um, yeah, I mean, my influences on electric are going to be the same as everyone, <laughs> everyone else's. It's like Pino. Uh, I really love Rob Malarkey's playing. I yeah. think he's like the best bass player in the world. Uh, it's just it's like every time I watch him, I'm like, Wow, what? That, oh, I don't understand how you sound like that. How do, how do how can I make myself sound like that? No idea. <laughs> like everything he plays, his sound, his like feel, his style. It's just I think it's like I've never heard him play and gone. Mm. It's like everything he's ever played, I've just been like, no, hey, that's that's incredible. <laughs> Always people mention as well. They sound fresh as well, don't they? Like, yeah. It feels like you you don't you feel like oh absolutely he, yeah. And he's probably you know, something he's kind of like refined over years, but it always feels like... Well, Absolutely, yeah. It always feels like he's improvising and, and being very reactive and aware of what's going on around him, which I think is something that... I and mean, I think that's the way, like, that I really love about Jamie's gig particularly and, and try and bring to everything, really, is like... And I guess that comes from having studied jazz and is that just being kind of aware and open of what's going on around you and being reactive, you know. So I, I really hate really hate playing music with people where it, where it feels like everyone's like head down and like ears closed where it feels like I could play something that's going to have you know like change a root note play an inversion or play a rhythmic thing that just to like throw something into the pot you know and then it feels like did anyone hear that like and not from an ego perspective of like did you <laughs> guys did you hear what I just played like are you joking me like not you know not like that but like from a thing of like come on, aren't we, we're all meant to be listening to each other and reacting and like, you know, um, that vibe, you know, I, I try and bring a bit of that to most things that I play. Even if it's like a West End show, you know, it's like you have an opportunity to be reacting to what's going on around you. I was, was thinking of like, if you do a fill and then you, and you accidentally look up after the fill and you feel that moment of pride and then no one's, no one's looking, looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. For yeah. 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 I mean, I definitely have had those moments where I'm like, are you joking that no one's looking at me after that? Like that's the, that's probably the best film I've ever played. Just none really of you. Yeah. It's like, none of you have heard it. Are you joking me? What was, come on. Come on. I mean, I, do you know Leo Richardson? Yeah. yeah. So like I play in his function band and I mean, I absolutely suck at slap bass. Like I am just, the worst. It sounds abysmal. I need to hear this. It's a, oh, it's, it's so really bad, man. Rough. It's so bad. <laughs> I just can't do it. Um, you know, I can, I can like just about sort of stagger my way through never too much, like the odd bit, but it still sounds pretty bad. But then we do like, you know, we do car wash and obviously it's got the, it's got the, the fill in it, like the break and the bass fill, like every chorus as well. And so Leo just used to like make a massive 
fat it in the choruses. I'd be there, be like the chorus, and he'd be like looking around and be like, oh, and obviously then I'd get like my nerves around and I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do this. I suck, I slap, you know, it gets to it, drops out. I do it inevitably rush because I'm absolutely crapping myself. And then I do it, and then Leo would turn around and just give me a ranking out, it's like a like a rating out of ten each time. So I'd like stuck it. He'd be like four. It's like oh man. Be like all right, next one, next one. He'd be like yeah, five. <laughs> Don't think it ever went above a six or a seven. Yeah, like I say, it's not my. It's definitely not my forte. <laughs> did you? Did you? So it sounds like you had kind of like a like a healthy amount of kind of uh, support musically when you were growing up in terms of having all these opportunities to play in different ensembles. Um, did you did, did you feel that you got that kind of like what was it like you know for you growing up? In yeah, of, well, so I mean, I, so I grew up in Northamptonshire, yeah. which which actually has a has a really amazing youth music service and and kind of scene, I guess. Like the the music service has has like three orchestras of different levels and ages. It has like three wind bands, three big bands, three brass bands, three choirs. Of, you know, like that the start from kind of eight, nine up to when you're like 18, you know, so you kind of start doing the baby stuff. And then by the time you're in the main orchestra, it's really good. And you're playing like Shostakovich symphony. So I played violin all the way through. So I did, you know, I spent my last few years of playing the violin, playing like Shostakovich and Tchaikovsky and all these massive romantic pieces that were like rock hard. Which has also been amazing for my sight reading. <laughs> you know, it's like there's no there's no bass part that's hard after like a first violin Shostakovich part. <laughs> you know, it's like trying to sight read that and being like, whoa, okay, that's a that's a lot of notes, and it's really hard. And it's like you get a bass part, it's like there's nothing in there that's stressful. You know, um, and so yeah, like I guess I and my school as well had a similar thing it had like a couple of big bands had a couple of choirs a couple of orchestras it's it's got it's really really amazing for youth music in Northamptonshire and so it was great I just kind of had the opportunity to play loads of different music I was you know I did like two or three big bands a week I did a small jazz ensemble I played in an orchestra I played in a string orchestra I played in a folk group sang in a choir you know it's all this stuff like every week for years um, and all the all the teaching was great, and so yeah, I felt very you know that's a, it was a very supportive, inspiring environment to be in really. Um, could you see that you can make a career out of it? it? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's an interesting one. I never really, I never felt like, I guess I never really felt like music was going to be like, careery careery, but. At the same time, like my parents say, they never heard me speak about doing anything else. But they also didn't say that I kind of talked loads about doing it as a career. I don't think I really thought about it like that. I just, I really enjoyed playing music. And so going to music college seemed like an obvious choice because, yeah, but I mean, I didn't know what else I was going <laughs> to, I didn't know what else I was going to go and study. Um, although actually I, in my first year of music college, I kind of thought about leaving and going doing history somewhere. Or something like that. I just had a bit of a meltdown. I was like, I don't think I like this. I don't know. And then ended up really enjoying it. But um, yeah, I think I just... It's just, I, like I really feel like it has to be fun. And I kind of lost my way with that a bit in the middle and particularly over the last few years. But I think particularly over the last... Yeah, and again, over the last kind of 18 months of everything being closed and playing at home I'm, I'm really reminded that like it just has to be fun like it's it's really fun and if it's not fun I probably shouldn't be doing it that much you know um so it's I mean as well as being fun what other things do you think it's important for kind of uh, like the younger generation of kind of wannabe session players to think about or consider when they're going into a career oh, um I think it's that. I think it's like make sure you're playing with people that get get your vibe for one of it. I mean, that sounds so lame, but like, but but I think it's really important. You know, it's like you've got to make sure your personalities work well together, and that you're just playing with people that make you enjoy playing. You know, like I've I've definitely had periods where I've worked with people that have made me feel bad about playing music. It's like I just don't let yourself be in those situations for too long or be aware that they're happening, I guess. Um, 
And I think it's just, you've got to, I think you have to, I think it's about, it's about being really clear about what you like and dislike and what you want to do and having some confidence in that, you know, because I, like, I always wanted to do West End work, you know, partly because, I mean, partly because it's a skill set. It kind of, in many ways, it encapsulates all my skill sets, like, you know, from all my orchestral playing, playing violin, it's like, I can play under a conductor really well. Because of all the reading, I can sight read really well. I play double bass and bass guitar. I really like a huge variety of music. So to, to some, I'm also like, I really love detail and, you know, like articulation or like trying to, like having to blend with something, you know. And so I love the thing of like in a Western show that you might have to, for like one particular song, you have to basically like ignore the brass and the strings and be like mega with the drums and on the click. And then another one, you might have to be kind of ignoring the click slightly and playing a bit back, but you're blending with a totally different section of the band or... I really love all that kind of nuance and things of being like, oh, that needs to be short, like the consistency of making a good sound and being like, oh, that needs to be loud, 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 and then like really back off and quiet. And, you know, I love all that detail. So in many ways, like I, it was just a, it was just a good thing for me to do. But also I really enjoyed it. I really liked that environment, but it was hard, you know, like a, I, I always felt a bit, like an outsider on my course at, at music college. I mean, not like in a massive sob story way, but just I remember kind of being in classes and the 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 teacher kind of going, oh, what's everyone been listening to this week? And it would go around and people would be going, oh, I found this Miles bootleg from 60, whatever. Blah, blah, blah. I've been listening to that. And somebody would be like, oh, I found these rare Thelonious Monk recordings. of. Oh. And they're like, I've been listening to this. I've been transcribing this. It gets to me, I'd be like been listening to quite a lot of James Taylor <laughs> you know just being like that's not is that it's not okay is it I'm not am I allowed to do that it's like I, I do like it <laughs> you know and the same thing of sitting there and learning about all this jazz stuff and it being like jazz 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 and I was like I sort of really want to play some shows as well and like but I, but I always felt quite confident about that so I think it's yeah it's important to be like unashamed about the music you want to play um, yeah, I don't know. I never, I never, never know how to answer the question about giving advice to people. I guess just, I don't know. Did you have to really kind of, if you had all those skills already, did you have to really kind of hassle to get into, or hustle to get onto shows in the first place? Or was it almost like everyone was like, laws can already do it? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, what, the, the funny thing about, it's incredibly hard to get a first West End Dep because no one wants to give you a show until they know that you're going to nail it. And obviously the eternal dichotomy is like, no one knows you can nail it till you've done a show. So, how, so you know, one of those things has to, has to happen first. I was very lucky that um, I did, while I was at college, I did a load of uh, amateur dramatic shows with Dave Elliott, actually. We, we, did, we did a load together for this company in Potter's Bar. And the MD was the was this guy called Mark Newport, I think his name was. He was the assistant MD on Les Mis. And he, I think this gig was like the first one he got when he was a student, like MDing. And so he just stayed loyal to it and he lived near there. And so he was quite he was quite involved in it. And so we did a few shows for him and he said, he, was, he kind of said, oh, you should come and sit in Les Mis sometime and see what it's like in town. And we both went, yeah, yeah, that'd be really cool. So I went in and the bass player that night was Adep, who's a guy called Daph Lewis. And we hit it off pretty well. Um, and he kind of said, oh, I Adep on this show and this show and this show and this show. And one of them was Wicked. I'd played a few songs from Wicked in another thing that I was doing. I was like, oh, yeah, I know that show. There's some good tunes in that. And he said, oh, well, here's my number. Give me a shout if you want to come and sit in there sometime. Uh, so I went and sat in with him. And then I had some lessons with him on the pad. Just, I mean, I guess it was pretty obvious what I was getting at but by the same thing I was also like this is just a really good opportunity to have a lesson with someone who does this for a living and be like how how like how do I get a show together to the right standard for that thing you know so even if you don't offer me any work like it's going to be so valuable to know what what it has to be and also just hear what you think of my playing you know it's like a very different teacher to what I was getting at college and so I had some lessons with him and then eventually he just kind of you know, and it was interesting. He gave me, the, like, I remember it was like my first lesson 
really on like that I'd ever had on playing any kind of like pop pop poppy music or groove types of things. And it was really interesting, you know. He had he had he said this stuff that like really changed the way I thought about playing. And it was about like my placement and where I was in the note. And it was basically like, oh yeah, I don't think I'm very I'm not very good at that. <laughs> and then I went I went away and practiced for six months or something. And I went and had another lesson with him. And it was like, oh yeah, that's way that's way better. And kind of did this thing. And I had a few lessons with him, learned the pad. And then he had a kind of depth space open up. So he he offered me a, a depth on Wicked. And then, but even then, I and even then when that started, I thought, I kind of thought, oh, I'm going to have loads of shows now. They're like, they'll all call me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of delusions of grandeur. And uh, even then, I didn't, I didn't get, a, I didn't get another show for like eight years or something. <laughs> this was ages till I got my next one. And then it all happened in one where I ended up with two other shows at the same within the same like month and a half due to someone moving, like the guy that was doing Dreamgirls moved to Hamilton, got me in on Hamilton, who took over on, the, uh, and Rich Coughlin took over on uh, Dreamgirls, and because he had his depth space to fill, and then he gave me a shout. So suddenly I had these two extra shows in one go, and then, and then from there it kind of started to snowball a little bit, because at that point then I guess people knew who I was, and I had a, a decent enough reputation in that world um, to the point that I then I then ended up doing one I, I had like a chair on one for six months which was on a show called Waitress which was which was cool Amazing and yeah. what's your kind of go-to gear if you, I mean I know you obviously probably use other people's gear on, when you're depping but yeah so stuff that you yeah do? so I guess actually you know it's, it, there's interesting parallels as well actually between the Jamie thing and the West End thing it's like that thing of like rental gear you know I think the reason that I sound good playing shows is that because of all Jamie's stuff, I'm used to that thing. It's like I'm used to rental double basses, I'm used to rental bass guitars, and the ones that are in pits are like way better quality than the rental ones. You know, I remember there was one in, there was one this rental double bass in um, Casablanca in Morocco, and it just didn't have a pickup on it, and they tried to mic it up with like a fifty-seven. And it was like a three thousand seat like outdoor auditorium. It's like, yeah, guys, it's something that's it's just not going to work, is it? It's, that's going to that's going to sound absolutely abysmal. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I think, but I think that thing has has really impacted on the fact that I'm I'm good, I'm good at the best thing gear wise. So yeah, I use other people's for that, but um, if I'm using my own for shows, I've got a Lakeland. 5594 I think it's called one of those American five string things with the it's got a jazz pickup and then a pickup that you can change to be certain you know, I mean I'm, as you can tell I'm not much of a gearhead Jack <laughs> which as is becoming painfully clear um, and then kind of otherwise I mean I'm a I'm a very much a P bass guy I've got a 75 and a 66 P bass that I really love <laughs> Except it's let up by the Except it's let up on my, my banister, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Just my most prized prize possession, my sort of most expensive instrument I own, and I've just propped it up against the banister hope, and hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, so those, I've got, a, I've got a, my double bass is kind of, it's like an early 20th century French double bass that's really beautiful. Um, I've got, a, I really like short scale bass guitars as well. I've got a Mustang and I've got this little Hagstrom Swedish thing from the, from the 60s that I got for 500 quid off eBay that is really fun and sounds amazing. Uh, I've got this Gibson EBO thing as well that's very cool. And I've got a couple of hollow bodies. I've got like a, yeah, I've got a Hofner, one of the little, um, not the McCartney one, the the other one. It's like the, I think it's called a club bass. Or so. It's like the same vibe, but with a with a more friendly body shape, like a cutaway thing. Um, and I've got a jazz bass as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm not like I keep thinking, oh, I should get all these things. I mean, really, I should just sell some stuff because really, I just end up using P basses on anything you know that I do <laughs> because I really like them. <laughs> As you know, as you can see. <laughs> so what have, you, what have you got coming up in the future then? What have I got coming up? So I'm, I'm doing all the Sunday matinees at Hamilton, which is going to be fun. 
Um, Jamie, we've got Jamie rehearsal start on Monday. We're, we were a week into Jamie's tour when everything stopped, pandemic-wise. And so we're starting the tour up again at the end of this month. Fingers crossed, we've got two shows in Paris and then something, then Denmark and then the UK stuff. So, yep, we've got some of that. Uh, a bit of teaching. I spent the summer, te- or I spent a couple of weeks in August teaching on a jazz summer school. Um, I'm trying to set up like a little double bass practice club vibe for the summer school students, which should be fun. Like maybe like a little monthly on Zoom, prep some stuff. Um, yeah, like kind of running one of those. I really enjoy teaching. So I'm sort of trying to, I've got a couple of, one-to-one students so looking to hopefully get some more so if people want to get in contact with you they can yeah of course I actually do have uh, I did some I did a couple of recordings for this podcast ages ago and the ongoing joke was that I'd never made a website even though in the first so I did two episodes two episodes of the same podcast four years apart and in the first one we talked about how I was going to make a website we did the second one four years later they're like have you made it I was like, absolutely not but I do now have a website I mean it's got a you know, it's not quite complete, but there is a website which is losgarrett.com. And Garrett is G-A-R-R-A-T-T. So yeah, on my website there's you can there's some videos of me playing and will soon be some recordings uh that I've been doing. Uh I'd quite like to I'd like to get into doing a bit of recording from home or just a bit of, like I really enjoy recording and that kind of creative thing. I've been doing a little bit of writing of bits and bobs, which is something that I've never really played with before. So I'd like to do some more writing, a bit more teaching, a bit more recording. I'm re- I'm just looking forward to playing again. Like I did my first Hamilton back last night and it was so exciting and brilliant being back in a pit and instruments and people playing and an audience. I mean it's just it's been so rubbish, hasn't it? It's just been so rubbish. And so it's just nice. It's great that music's coming back. It's, it's great. <laughs> it's very exciting. I'm very thankful for it. Um, yeah, I think Jamie's going to be very fun. So that's to the end of the year. And um, yeah, I don't know, really. I don't know what's coming. Yeah, just quite a bit of Jamie stuff in the short term. I guess getting back to the other shows that I step on as well um and yeah I'm kind of keen to keen to like do some more writing actually I kind of in, have enjoyed getting a bit stuck into that and so keen to do a bit more of that I have to co-write though because I it's I'm too unproductive on my own because I basically just I go too insane I start trying to like produce it and edit it while I'm like trying to come up with the idea so it's like I'll do something and it's immediately be like well that's rubbish isn't it it's like it doesn't matter just like finish the idea and so I just kind of talk myself out of stuff immediately so I find co-writing easier by a long shot amazing mate that's great cool nailed it thanks great. so much that's a pleasure man <laughs>